Paul Laverty. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> this is where we're going to start because a lot of people who might have seen Ken Loach's films and been very interested in Ken's work don't really know about you. But you're actually a screenwriter and you're the writer behind a lot of his films, aren't you? So why did you become a screenwriter? Like most things in my life, Jackie, is a, by accident, I suppose. After finishing uni and, and work, I wanted to, I wanted to um, learn another language, visit another country. And I suppose I was at that stage of life in my, my early 20s, I got very interested in Nicaragua. And I suppose it was really, I suppose that was the issue that crystallised so, so much for me and many of my generation. You know, I'm, I'm now in my 60s and still my closest friends, even the ones I met in Glasgow, I didn't meet them in Glasgow, I met them in Managua, in Nicaragua. But um, I suppose like after the revolution in 1979, you know, it, it touched many, many people's lives. You know, Nicaragua only had a population of something like 3 million people, which is almost impossible to imagine that the most powerful country on earth was determined to destroy it. And um, and for that reason, I think there was so much kind of solidarity from around the world. You know, so for us, it was a kind of our, our, um, our, our Spanish moment from a previous generation, I suppose. I went out there and did the usual with many other international brigades, you know, pick coffee, you know, learn a bit of Spanish, try to figure out what was going on came back home again. And then the next time I went out, I went out with a solidarity organisation called Scottish Medical Aid to Nicaragua. So all my colleagues, you know, did something useful. <laughs> they were doctors or nurses. Uh, and uh, and I ended up, to cut a very long story short, working for a human rights organisation. And I suppose at the end of my three years there working, I was sick and tired of writing human rights reports. I was sick and tired of talking to journalists. And in my innocence, I thought, I'm going to write a film about this. And, uh, and of course, everyone said I was bonkers, and I probably was. This is a country at war. I had no um, I had no infrastructure in, you know, in, in cinema, you know, very, very few actors. They had dancers and musicians. Uh, but when I came back, I was determined to do that, and I wrote to lots of people. And what I had was the, the great fortune of crossing paths with my, my great comrade, Ken Loach, you know, and uh, I remember he said to me, he says, well, you know, I wrote to him. I mean, I wrote to lots of people, but Ken was the one who answered most thoughtfully. And he says, well, this is a very long shot, but if you're ever in London, come down for a cup of tea. And we just talked. And what he was interested in was why I was there, what I'd seen, you know, and, um, and so that was the beginning of a, which turned out to be a, you know, a, a, long, a, long, a long partnership. Yeah, so it was kind of accident I started in screenwriting. But in another way, it wasn't because I suppose it came out of a fury. I was an eyewitness to absolutely incredible barbarity and cruelty and um, and the great irony of course and the great aberration of course it's gone full circle again and Daniel Ortega and the cabal around them have become horrific and uh, as cruel as Somoza was. So do you I mean that that really strikes me as very interesting partially as well because mm. I was going to come on to speak to you about the wind that shakes the barley oh, yeah. and the story that you've just told just really reminds me mm. of so many of the mm. tensions there about the complexities mm. of what happened to people who are in struggle. And I actually mm. think in terms of being on the left at this moment mm. in time, mm. in this country and globally, mm. we see those tensions sort of mm. playing out kind of red in tooth and claw in many ways, in a way that I think was perhaps because I'm hitting 70, actually, which, which so I remember the times you're talking about. And it, it wasn't quite so obvious then. Do you think it's different now politically to be on the left and to be in struggle than it was when you started and decided you wanted to be a, a screenwriter? Yeah. Well, I couldn't have written The Wind That Shakes the Barley, I think, if I hadn't seen the war in Nicaragua. You know, because people, I mean, Nicaragua was, you know, you go there in your mid-twenties. I mean, I was never in danger the same way as the Nicaraguans were, but we still saw a war zone and you saw people who were dying and, you, and I interviewed people who had children who'd been kidnapped or children who had been tortured and murdered in the most absolutely foul fashion that is still 
makes me quiver today. But there's also something about when you see violence too. And not only that, but the people who commit violence. I remember talking to young contractors who'd been trained by the CIA. You know, they, taught me, they, they, they told me how they'd finished off people with knives after an ambush. And they were youngsters, they were teenagers. And it was heartbreaking. And you could see the kid was destroyed. I mean, I don't doubt that kid committed suicide. And I met people who'd been destroyed by it. So there was a, in a strange sort of way, you know, when I went to try and imagine what was happening in the window shakes the barley with the flying columns. And, you know, when you are in a war situation and you are being pursued or you have to kill, you know, there's a line in the, in the film, which always I remember, it just left me kind of shaken when I wrote it. And he just says, I've crossed the line, yeah. you know, that he's crossed the line. And this Ireland we're fighting for better be worth it. This is this goes back to your point that we now have to see everything, every conflict, whether it's domestic mm. or whether it's international, in black and white terms. Mm. You're either for your Ukraine or mm. you're for Putin. You're either a pro-Palestinian mm. or you're an anti-Semite. There is no any any effort complicate that story mm. and to mm. make it more subtle mm. it's slammed it's eviscerated and it's destroyed and and that's what i take from what you say so how mm. then mm. you know taking that experience mm. which you know i found deeply moving what you were talking about mm. for so many reasons how do you see what's going on at the moment politically in terms of mm. what's happening with creative people and how they express what's mm. happening? Well, it's the, it's the question, I suppose, as a writer and uh, certainly my collaboration with Ken, it's one you, you, one you wrestle with all the time because, you know, many, many people have said, well, why don't you, why have you not done a film, you know, on, on, uh, on Cuba or Palestine? Well, actually, we did a film on Cuba, you know, with my partner, a theatre boy, called Julia, about a dancer. But the, the point is, you know, I think when you're writing, you know, the, the, you're looking for, you're looking, you're looking to entangle things and life by its nature is messy and it's complicated. And those are the best stories because otherwise it just comes like Ajiprop. I think Ajiprop has got its place. You know, a song has got its place, a poem has got its place, you know, but a film or a novel, you know, it's got to have a very special quality. I think it has to have those three dimensional qualities to it. It's got to look at the contradictions, you know, and, in this, in these film, you know, in the in the, in the in the last, you know, series of films that Ken and myself, you know, and my colleagues along with us, we have worked on it. I mean, it takes a lot of untangling, isn't it? You know, what happened in 1984 with the miners' strike? We had an eight-hour day where we had strong trade unions, and then we see that journey to the world of sorry, we missed you. You know, when someone is driving a van by himself, tied to a nap, who believes he's an entrepreneur of the road, a warrior of the road, and he's working 14 to 16 hours a day exploiting himself. What is that political journey? That's a complicated journey. It's so many political choices. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the disasters that has happened has been in terms of how we narrate relationships between people who are different, because... And I have to be careful of what I say because, you know, I'm part of that profession and generation that spent a lot of time on anti-racist training. That was what I was doing. And I started as a teacher doing it and, I, and then I, I, I became other things doing it and doing it in the community. And just like you, I learned that the last thing you do if you want to change people's attitudes, is point at them and scream racist mm -hmm. and stop them speaking. And for me, what I find terrifying at the moment is the way that that, 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 that those edges where we can rub up against each other, which can be fruitful and highly productive and creative, but can also be tense mm. and, and dangerous, mm. are being manipulated. And mm. how, as writers, how, as activists, 
we're no longer allowed to speak about it in mm. that way. Mm. Well, I think the climate has totally changed, you know, re really totally changed. But, um, but if you give into that, you censor yourself. And if you censor yourself, you will never get to the root of things. It will always be on the surface. You know, so uh, I think you owe it to your, you, you owe it to the work, you know, not to make compromises with that. And often stuff, often the stories, I mean, that's why we tell stories that, you know, yeah. the parables are some of the, are some of the most, some of the most challenging ever, you know, you go right, up, love your neighbour as yourself. I mean, now. Mike, um, I've had a lovely conversation and I have to say, I'm very sorry that I'm in South London and you're up there because I'd love to have a much longer conversation about writing and creativity and, you mm. know, how we convey complex ideas. I could be there until five o'clock yeah. tomorrow morning on a midsummer's day doing this. So. <laughs> but yes. instead, I'm going to let Mike go on. Yeah, no, I was interested. To, I was listening avidly to your conversation there and just just enjoying your, your exchange. And I'm reminded of a, a quote by Woody Guthrie that a, I think it was an in, interview you cited, Paul, mm -hmm. and he described human beings as, as great big hoping machines. Mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, almost evolved to expect, to have ambition, to believe and to dream. Mm -hmm. Where, um, looking around at the political landscape now, where, where do you see cause for people like us to hope and dream? We must have this conversation maybe after the old oak comes out, really. Yeah. Because, you know, there's, there's one in scene in particular, which if I talk about it, it'll be a terrible spoiler. But this notion and this question to me is, is absolutely vital. It's one thing, you know, me and all the privileges I have being optimistic, you know, it's another thing if you've just come from a war zone, you know, and when you've seen such systematic and absolute violence, you know, when you feel kind of dismantled or, you know, or, or, or so marginalised or destroyed, you know, that's where it's harder to have hope, really, isn't it? You know, that's where it's, it's, it's much tougher. And many, many people are sunk. There, there's one scene in the, in the Full Old Oak, which I think will, will, will echo this. But I think um, if, you look at the, if you look at the world objectively, you know, with the cold light of day, there's many things to become absolutely depressed about, especially the climate change and, you know, our incapacity to listen to the scientists. I always find that just absolutely massively depressing. But at the same time, um, just given that, uh, uh, this is the great thing about being involved with grassroots organizers or, or community groups or your neighbor or your church or whatever it is, you know, where you find human contact. Because in that daily contact, if you don't live in a war zone, you'll find people who will look after you. And most people actually do care. And actually most people do have a sense of injustice. And they are furious when people lie and corporations dictate. And um, and I think when they look at the, the political landscape just now, you can see why people are just so furious. And, and so I think that goodwill has to be harnessed and people have to make the changes in their lives that they can, you know. And I think making incremental, incremental improvements in your life and how you look after yourself and your neighbour and your family, all these things give you nourishment, you know. And I think they're very, very important. But of course, it begs the big, big question of what happens when there's so much control just now by corporations. We don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. All you have to do is just look at the, the empirical information of where power and money lies, you know, and that is massively depressing. And it's how you, how you bridge that massive gap, which is the endless question of, you know, political representation. And I think that leads again to the really big elephant in the dining room now, you know, with what's happening, you know, with the the Labour Party, you know, one centimetre behind the Tories, you know, and I, and I often think of, you know, what Keir Hardy would do just now if he climbed off that banner in the Durham Gala, you know, and he looked and said, you know, what, what's happening? You know, where is the political representation, you know, of, of the working class? And so there'd be a, an intersection of, you know, the people who are disabled, the people who are marginalised, you know, the, the, the people who you know, can't get a house, you know, the, the people who are, the trans who are abused. I mean, there's, there's, there's such a huge possibility of people coming together around common interest, you know, and, and I think that is the great challenge. And I think that's why the, 
the Labour Party is such a Trojan horse at the moment because you know everything they do is just to the left of the Tories and they're not they're not going to the root of things and and seeing where power can change. So um, how to find hope in that is 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 really really the big question and that huge vacuum there is now in political representation. I'm just wondering in terms of your own creative life. Mm. Oh, well, I'm a big fan. I'm, I'm sure you are of Darren McGarvey uh, and Darren McGarvey's work. And mm. he speaks so uh, eloquently about his struggles to break through uh, the class ceiling uh, uh, from his a very deprived uh, background of Pollock, dysfunctional uh, kind of uh, family experience, addictions and so on. Um, and he's, I saw him recently in Edinburgh and he was speaking about trying to sell his first book and being squirreled away in publishers when he went to physically meet them. He would put them in a side room because they didn't want a working class guy <laughs> visibly a mm. seen in a building frequented by um, you know those who have access to cultural capital. They, they, mm -hmm. he, he was literally squirreled away in the side rooms because they were embarrassed to have him around. And now he's a best-selling author and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just wondering whether, um, mm -hmm. we hear a lot of musicians say this as well, of course, that back in the 70s, 80s, um, even maybe the early 90s, working-class musicians could mm -hmm. sign on and say, I'm a musician. I'm trying to build my craft. I'm trying to break through. Nowadays, you, you can't get close to doing that because you're sanctioned, mm -hmm. you're policed. I'm just wondering uh, yeah. in your own field how easy, difficult, what, what are the, the, the kind of challenges that working class mm -hmm. writers, uh, producers, directors face when trying to break into film? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. I actually met a, a producer in Glasgow yesterday and, and, and he, he receives the script. So I was just asking him how he felt and, and he just said it was, it, was, it was very, very tough for young, you know, um, Black and minority and working class kids to break through, and he felt a lot was to do with confidence. You know, even the letters that would come in, he says, you know, from, it was from a working class person. It was usually, oh, we, you know, it was, you know, they're bending over backwards, to, you know, to say, you know, please read it. Whereas people from a different background just expect you to read it, you know. And I'm, I mean, I, I'm not a producer. I don't, I'm, I don't receive all this, but you know, just I suppose we have to not be surprised by who are the gatekeepers, and and the irony is. I think, you know, many, many of the people who live in working class backgrounds, you know, they see the contradictions of life in a much more stark form. The language is vital. The stories are absolutely crazy, you know. So, you know, they're often steeped in actually a very, very, a world which just, you know, it, you know, it's, it just sparks things off on you. You know, how many characters you see, the, the mad stories you hear, what you see in what you see in these communities is different from you know some 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 quite middle class area that prejudice against working class characters i remember when we did the wind that shakes the barley and because it won the palm door in can it was really viciously attacked you know by people like gove and the times and the telegraph came out of it but I also remember one of the one of one of the furious reviews and it said even the train driver quotes poetry you know <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, it was just fueled with class hatred and kind of an ignorance and that, you know, a train driver could not quote poetry. One of the things um, I know, uh, you know, we're going, we're, we're kind of coming on to the end now, but one of the things I wanted to mm -hmm. express when we were talking is the way that you're talking about the production of art and who controls the production of art and how those people now increasingly can only come from a privileged background. That is also what we're now getting in our political culture. I laughingly looked at an advert from Labour and it said, the Labour Party, the party for workers. <laughs> and knowing what the selection process is and knowing as a fact that I think there are no more real, what we would call working class uh, MPs really coming through yet. Yeah, I know a couple of them are mm. candidates at the moment, but whether they come through or not. I mean, it strikes me mm. that politics, I'm not talking about activism, mm. the level that me and Mike work on, is increasingly now become professionalized, mm. that most of the people 
go to a few universities and a few schools and mm -hmm. that's how you become a politician and we're getting the same thing in mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. as we're seeing you know mm -hmm. in cultural production you know the film the jeremy corbyn film that's, that's been yeah. banned yes i mean i mean i haven't seen it you know i mean i don't know if it's good or bad uh, but i would like to see it you know and then you make up your own mind that that's what you know that's what people do you you know you you go along and you see it and then you judge it and you watch it with your friends and you discuss it and you tear it apart or say, well, this bit worked or that didn't work or there wasn't the evidence for that. But It may sound perverse, but that's what gives me some measure of, of hope. We, we, we spoke about Winnie Guthrie's belief that we are hoping machines. A really elite that is confident, assured eh, of its place in the world does not shut down discussion, yeah. debate, reflection in the way this really elite is, yeah. it, it, it tells of a really elite that's terrified of its own shadow. Yeah. Yeah, and that should give us confidence. Yeah, yeah. It's the, they're coming to the end of their empire and whether that is global warming or unrest by people because you know the conditions of people are not going to get better, they're going to get worse. Who knows? But it's very, very clear mm. that the status quo mm. as we have known it in our lifetimes Mm. It's actually coming to an end. I know you've got you're coming to an end now, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. But we quoted Woody Guthrie, but actually sometimes it's quite good to change the historical time frame. And um, this was a, a little quote from Saint Augustine, who was born in the year three five four, and he talked about hope as well. I don't know if you know this little quote from Saint Augustine, but I'm paraphrasing. But he said, "Hope has two beautiful daughters: anger at the way things are." And the courage to try and save them, trying to trying to change them, and then and I think that's you know it makes hope you know a much more dangerous mm. concept, but it's also fascinating to think you know that's from three hundred from from um, from over fifteen hundred years ago. So we're yeah. as human species we're we're still at it, and and I think that's what keeps us going. Well, as we know, the struggle continues, and with that, mm -hmm. we're going to say. Mm. goodbye and thank you very much Paul. Thank, thank you very much Jackie thanks Mike, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you both, much really, so really a pleasure, real pleasure Paul Aye, aye, aye